sound. I mean, it's it's risk it's risk based, and um, you know, it's in response to the threats that are there. As we've noted, the threats are pretty you know they're they're pretty standard porting from the you know traditional world into the cloud world. So the the, the trick is is you know how do you port them over and make them effective? And I think that's what your question is. And I think the, um, you know, part of it is yes, there are some that don't port over cleanly, and those have to be adjusted using the, the secret sauce and some, you know, uh, custom-made code. And there's things that are uh, some hybrid of custom-made code and standard traditional technologies. And I think you also look at it from the stack level as well, which is that you know, when you're down at the infrastructure level, you know, host and network level, it's it's a lot of the same, you know, basic controls. It's your vulnerability assessment, and it's your penetration testing, and it's your and as you're doing all those good security practices. When it comes to the unknown threats, I think you know, what's important is, is your agility as a security organization and also your, you know, uh, is, is your adherence to something like you know, an information security management system. So Microsoft, we're certified in uh, ISO 27001, and we have a pretty robust ISMS. And um, that's that plan, do, check, act cycle. And I think that you need to constantly be doing a risk-based analysis. Um, part of the difficulty with that is what's your telemetry there? And that's where places like Shadow Server and the work that you're doing and the work that we're doing collaboratively here, hopefully, about identifying risks from our customers, from other uh, leaders in the industry, from researchers, and then we gotta get that in and we have to adjust to that quickly and try to, try to, you know, I don't know about trying to plan out the next attack or see what the next thing that's coming down the road. I mean, that's the black swan event, you know? Yeah. I know people are familiar with the black swan, you know? meme, but, you know, the black swan event is something that, it, by definition, you can't plan for. Yeah. So um, you can only kind of game it out so far down the road before you, you just have to be agile and try to react. Alex, I know you guys have customized a lot of stuff. What's, what's <laughs> going on at Facebook? <laughs> a little bit. I, uh, I don't think you'll ever be in a situation when you can move completely from uh, product to platform security. It's always going to be somewhere in the middle. Um, even in, in, in a case like Facebook, where the bulk of the security, to the vast majority of it, happens at a platform level on, on Facebook, it's customized systems specifically tailored towards Facebook, you're never at a place where you can completely throw away all the traditional product security. Um, our end users still need antivirus for the situations where they get a virus in an email attachment. Um, there's also a lot of overlap there where we're responding to threats as quickly as possible, but there's still additional ways that users can protect themselves and supplement the security that we're providing with traditional uh, product security. Um, examples of that are you know, WebSense URL filtering products at, at the gateway will also protect you if there's something distributed over Facebook that we don't, we don't get to before one of your users clicks on it. And uh, you can't get rid of that. Like that's, that's still a completely necessary component of securing the, uh, the, the user. And uh, I, th I think the scarier part is that so much of it, when as show, so much of it shifts to the, the platform level, you become completely dependent on the platform provider and it becomes very important for the platform providers to really be on top of the security of their systems. Um, when there's, when there's a vulnerability in Facebook, most of our end users have very little options other than waiting for us to fix it. And we really have to be on the ball about fixing it before any of them damage it. You can take pretty simple examples, like a, a basic cross-site scripting vulnerability. Like There's some no script plugins that you could be running, but the vast majority of them aren't running that. And that vulnerability is going to exist until Facebook resolves it. At a, at a more platform level, if there's a, if you're a, on a, a, a virtual instance that has a vulnerable version of a VMware running underneath it, you're at the mercy of the, the platform provider to, to get it fixed for you. You don't have some of the options that you would have in a traditional plain product security. One of the good examples that I can think of was like some of the, the first uh, Microsoft worms that started going around, Blaster, for example. Um, it's the, the permanent resolution is on Microsoft's end. Like they have to get the, the blaster patch out to, to fix it. But in between that, there are so many other ways that the end user could protect themselves before Microsoft gets the patch out. Uh, most people were putting firewall rules in place, updating their antivirus, 
uh, installing IDS signatures that we're all stopping this and buying time for uh, the, the official patch to come out. And uh, a lot of that's missing in a, in a cloud environment. Great, well let's see um, if uh, we can get some questions from the field. Is, uh, has anyone here actually reported an abuse to any of these companies before? What? <laughs> you guys are at the wrong conference. <laughs> All right. So I'm sure that a lot of vendors use their cloud to secure the cloud, but uh, I'll let them. <laughs> Who wants to take a stab at that one? Can, a can Amazon testing, help testing. secure Microsoft's cloud? Uh, yeah, <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, it, okay, so let, let's, how far do we go? So cloud A is secured by cloud B. Who secures cloud B? Cloud C? Is it turtles all the way down? Um, look it up if you don't know what that means. <laughs> I think one of the, one of the, the the points I would make is that there are companies, for example, right now that help you balance clouds, like RightScale, for example where you can take multiple cloud providers and shift data and, and scale and maneuver between them. But there actually has not been a business or a market yet that's, that's matured or even come out based off of that, that idea. Um, there's also obviously physics involved and technology involved and you have to have cooperation um, and APIs and et cetera. But uh, um, I, I guess it, speaking as someone from the in infrastructure level, right? That, which is where we really focus our efforts. Uh, we view that keeping that infrastructure safe is our top priority. And there's a variety of ways we do that. And one of the things that we've actually started to do to address some of the uh, more common forms of abuse is we've started to put limits in place. Um, you know, if you run an SMTP server on a EC2 instance, we actually are going to throttle the amount of outbound SMTP mail. Uh, we have a limit on the number of instances you can start as a new customer until we verify who you are. Uh, and the, these are actually very highly effective at just stopping a lot of the really common uh, patterns of abuse that, that we typically see. And so by then putting those in place, right, we can now focus our efforts on maybe the more esoteric kinds of things uh, that, that might be a little bit more difficult to detect. Um, it, a roundabout answer to your question, but I, I guess probably I would say that all of the people who are in the business of being cloud providers would have kind of the similar response is that, um, and that they're going to they're going to do everything they can to protect their own platform, and because they built the platform from scratch, quite often it has to be internal knowledge that does that. Any anyone else, Michael? Or? Well, I just I mean, I, where did that come from? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, this takes a minute to warm up. I mean, I would I would I would echo that sentiment. I mean, there are I mean, I think that is partially partially the solution is that you know th that there are security services that are in the cloud already i mean i qualis comes to mind right is a is a is a platform service basically um you know that that can be used to good advantage um but but i echo what what steve said which is basically you know we are protecting at infrastructure level a lot of that stuff as we talked about is is kind of the the you know secret sauce of of what we're doing behind the scenes and some uh, porting the controls over and so you know there's just um 
the concern about then if if there's data then that's being housed by another party that comes from us, our own data or whatever it is, that we would have concerns about securing that as well. So, I mean, it's a, it's a valid question, but uh, I think I think that's the right answer. Yeah. Go ahead, right here. So that was a business decision that we made, uh, was the, that we didn't feel that this would be a successful business if we didn't respect privacy in such a way that customers could come to the service and, and just know that their data remains theirs, right? Um, and we're, we're trying, you know, we want to be very clear about that, that your data belongs to you, it doesn't belong to us. We don't do any third party data mining across it. Um, you know, it's not the same thing as Amazon.com where you actually want that data mining to happen, right? Your data is isolated, it, it is yours. Uh, so I, 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 I hate to sound like I keep repeating myself, but if you want to do in inspection of the data that's coming into and out of your machines, uh, the mechanisms are there for you to install those inspection tools yourself. And, and run them in, in, in your own instances. Uh, if we were to start inspecting every single datagram coming into and out of our data center, uh, I, I honestly, I don't think that we could do that because there's just way, way too much. And it also decreases your, your ability to, um, um, to, to know that your data remains private. So we, we really don't want to get into that business. I, you're, you, just, you just hit on a, a very important thing that I'm spending quite a lot of time thinking about lately, and I had a hint on it, and I never got a chance to do it. Um, it's, so there's, there's a couple of things. Uh, one, I want to introduce you to a concept, um, the notion of the disinterested third party. Uh, you know, unlike your own employees, we don't know anything about the data that you store on with, with AWS. Same goes for Azure, same goes for Facebook, same goes for everybody, right? Um, so by lacking the context, we quite often lack motivation to do damage. And you know, I, I think that there's, there's an opportunity to have a conversation here about that particular notion, right? Is that maybe you get an, a higher level of security because we don't know anything about what's going on, right? Yeah. Right, right. So, yeah. So let me um, now let me introduce a second thing that I've been trying to think about: is this notion of compliance by inclusion, or by incorporation? So, for example, we can help you achieve like HIPAA compliance up to a certain point, say up to the hypervisor. Okay, we 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 can do that, and we actually have a published white paper on how to, how to do that. Uh, then you need to do certain things in your applications on top of that, right? And so sort of by incorporation of what we've done plus what you've done, you can then achieve a certification or achieve a compliance. Um, you know, we've made it a lot easier to see our SAS 7 report so you can see what the control objectives were and what the auditor's findings were. We'll do the same thing when the ISO 27001 certification is done. And again, that will be sort of a by inclusion method, right? One of the things that the challenges that we find is trying to educate these certification bodies on on what does it mean to be compliant when you don't own the hard drive anymore, and and we've actually gotten some traction in in helping them uh, think in new ways about you know what kind of language to use, uh, what kind of legal agreements might need to be in place. So I, I suspect in the next 12 months um, you're going to see some solidification uh, uh, around that.